What's up and welcome to my quickfire meta guide for the DPS Warrior in TPC Classic. Now very briefly, I wanted to make quick guides like this as it was exactly what I wanted as I searched for my ideal alt class, but alas, I could not find. It's a sad story, I know. So I'll be breaking this video down into those different sections that I was personally looking for. And these are, first and foremost, the PvE basics and what 10 seconds might look like in a raid encounter. And I'm calling this a raid snapshot, essentially, for these videos. And following this, we're going to look at where the spec shines in PvE and then follow that up with the limitations of what the role basically is and has as part of its kit and just overall position in the raid. Finally, we'll look at professions as briefly as possible, though there's quite a lot to talk about in regards to warriors on this topic. And we'll go over PvP broadly, um, but again, just a small disclaimer, if you want any very specific PvE hints or super secret stuff that's, you know, skill based, you're probably going to look for a dedicated PvP guide because I'm just going to provide a pretty broad overview. With that said, let's get into the basics. For Fury, your standard build is going to be 17.44.0. Similarly to Classic WoW at the moment, you will spend points down to Impale and Anger Management in the Arms Tree and spend the remaining points in Fury. Much of the spec is pretty straightforward and locked in. However, the three points and improved Thunderclap from the Arms Tree can be spent on more points in Iron Will or improved Charge. This is essentially because, similarly to improved demo in Classic WoW at the moment, only one warrior needs to be specced into it because you can assume they have it up in the raid. This is typically your tank in TBC, or one of your tanks rather, but do check obviously, it's a great benefit to incoming damage on the tank and will help you tank dungeons in your DPS spec if you wish to have that option, but ultimately you can kind of move those three points around. In the Fury Tree, we're going to take 5% crit from Cruelty, 5 and improved demo because Unbridled Wrath's proc chance is greatly lowered with a proc per minute in TBC, then 5 in Commanding Presence for better shouts, 5 in Enrage to access Flurry, 5 in Dual Wield Spec, and we max out Weapon Mastery which helps our expertise needs by reducing chance for dodge by 2%. Finally, we take everything we have budget for, which amounts to 5 in Flurry, 3 in Precision, 1 in Bloodthirst of course, where you get to put 1 out of 2 in Improved Whirlwind, which helps our rotation around in terms of timing, and 5 into Improved Berserker Stance alongside Rampage, the new damage based cooldown for Fury in TBC after Death Wish's defection to the Arms Tree. Now, if you want to go for Arms PvE, your spec has been quite symmetrical to the Fury build in a lot of places, but is moving the latter points into the Deep Arms talents instead, becoming a 33-28 build. We once again go down to Impale and Anger Management, but continue to take the damage boosts from Two Hand spec, Death Wish, and then into our Weapon spec, Mortal Strike, Improved Disciplines, and of course Blood Frenzy which is a raid-wide buff of 4% increased physical damage. A note on your weapon specialization is that sword spec is your highest DPS option by default, and it's largely going to be down to you wanting to pick up swords throughout your journey in TBC for PvE purposes. In the Fury Tree, we spend the talents very similarly to the Fury build we just discussed, but instead of putting points into dual wield spec, we put them into improved slam for a very quick slam time, which goes down to 0.5 seconds, and 3 out of 5 flurry. A specific note for arms in this tree is that depending on the exact proc, proc scripting sorry, for Unbridled Wrath, it may be better to use 3 out of 5 in Unbridled Wrath and 2 out of 5 in Improved Demo. This was something discussed on the old Elitist Jerks forum, which was kind of the high-end theory crafting forums of the time, as TBC was approaching Wrath's release, but wasn't fully resolved, so this may be something we discover better when live servers hit. That said, if you're not the only warrior specced into improved demo in your raid, once again, we can kind of get away with moving points anyway. So if you want to hedge your bets regardless, then sure, go ahead. As long as five out of five improved demos up, you're all good to go. So once we are talented as Fury Arms, what do we want to care for in regards to our stats? Well, first and foremost, we're gonna be stacking hits till 9%, and this includes if you're taking precision as a Fury Warrior. If you're dual wielding, hit has some value over that, 
but isn't really that special. It's mainly about making sure that your special abilities hit because you're going to have a lot of rage once you get enough gear. You're then going to want to stack expertise to the 6.25% dodge reduction point, which includes 2% from our weapon mastery. And if you are orc or human, obviously that little extra expertise does help as well. Following this, we're going to be looking for crit, strength, attack power, and armor penetration. And this will largely be dynamic in value depending on your current gear. That said, however, armor penetration provides exponential gains as you get more of it, rather than any diminishing returns, which is experienced by every other stat. This is ultimately why they removed the stat entirely from the game later on. However, in the late game, as you get more of this armor pen, it's going to become a dominant stat in your sim tool all the way up to the 1350 armor cap. That said, haste will typically be your final lowest value stat outside of extra hit because it's quite low value for both specs comparatively. And I do want to put an addendum here that modern sim tools may find a perfect storm of circumstances where some haste may provide a big benefit but at present this seems unlikely. It's just not a very strong stat for warriors unless it's in boatloads of amount and the item budgets don't really work out in its favor. We've got our stats ready, our talents ready. How are we going about life in our raids? Well, Fury is very similar to Vanilla Fury. You'll be keeping Bloodthirst and Whirlwind on cooldown whilst using Rage above 60 to dump into Heroic Strike. The main difference to Vanilla is that you'll be keeping up the Rampage buff whilst trying to avoid delaying Bloodthirst or Whirlwind by doing so. As such, you will typically be looking to refresh Rampage with 2-3 to three seconds remaining in a GCD that you would usually have Heroic Striked in. Under 20% you'll be spamming Execute and squeezing in a Bloodthirst if you ever spike to above 30 Rage because essentially Bloodthirst is more damage per Rage than Execute once you have more than 30 rage. As arms though, it's all about slam timing. You'll be weaving your slam with your autos to ensure slam doesn't reset your auto swing. Alongside this, you'll be keeping Mortal Strike and Whirlwind on cooldown as a priority. The typical cycle can be summarized with four slams, two Mortal Strikes and a single Whirlwind. Under Execute, you will have the choice between spamming Execute and your normal rotation. If you're not forced to move, it is conventional wisdom that your normal rotation will be higher DPS because Execute does not scale with your weapon damage and you're using a two-hander. However, when required to move a lot during the final 20%, you will probably wish to Execute to avoid any mishaps with your auto and slam timing because you don't want to be delaying your autos with slam. So, this is how each spec performs or goes about its business in a raid. What are they actually good at? Well, first and foremost, both specs do strong damage on single target, with Fury being ahead of arms in individual contribution. Likewise, they both have strong AoE, with arms having the highest on-demand AoE potential for melee specs between Sweeping Strikes, Death Wish, and their prolonged recklessness duration from improved disciplines. Aside from the ranged bias that pervades many TBC encounters, both Warrior specs put out very high damage, as long as they can maintain uptime. With that said, warriors truly shine on fights with very little movement, which becomes more common towards the end of the game just when all that armor penetration starts stacking up for big numbers. A great example of this is the final TBC encounter, Kill Jaden. In this fight, you're not going to be moving too much, there are some adds to deal with, you have to move inside of a little dome that protects you from the ex explosions, and essentially you're going to be just pumping damage into a single target for the majority of the fight with very minimal movement compared to a lot of encounters in TBC. And from this point, as you can see in the clip I've got showing here, Fury will truly be a top DPSer on these kinds of fights, with arms being relatively strong but not quite as good unless there is good potential for some two-handed sweeping strike shenanigans. Arms does, however, provide this above average DPS when it can maintain uptime, whilst also providing a raid-wide 4% physical damage buff as we've discussed in the talent section. This damage buff across tanks, the hunters, their pets and other melee is pretty huge to the point where arms may be seen as the more desirable spec as far as hardcore raid comps are concerned 
at least until Glaives entered the equation. So this sounds overall quite different to what you've heard about TBC raiding and Warrior, I suspect, a lot of doom and gloom about this role. So what am I not telling you? Well, essentially what you've heard is largely true. Many encounters are not kind to melee, and here lies the biggest downside to both specs. They are, obviously, melee specs. Plain and simple, playing melee has an inbuilt downside that raid encounters won't allow you to provide as much of a contribution as ranged players may do, especially before tier 6 where encounters become less hostile for melee and armor penetration items start becoming more common. In addition to this, whilst encounters become kinder towards the end of the game, they have that ever-present gear reliance that means even if you play those earlier encounters that are quite unfriendly perfectly, you will still be waiting till around Zalaman tier 6 kind of time to begin scaling super well towards the top of the DPS meters where possible. Outside of that though, there really isn't much to dislike if you're set on playing melee at the least. It's hard not to recommend Warrior when considering their performance and ability to tank as offspec. This brings us to professions and the eternal mention of leatherworking. As far as metagaming goes, 20 drum users will be the aim and as such should be considered a lock for many players seeking to min-max. Beyond this, I have to mention blacksmithing. To get to the point, blacksmithing provides very strong weapons based on your blacksmith spec and maysmiths can craft a big weapon for one-handers called Dragon Strike, which is really strong for Fury due to how much haste it gives. And whilst we've discussed how haste isn't super valuable as a stat individually, in this much quantity, with this kind of proc rate, it's really strong. And this will last you all the way to end game weapons from Black Temple and Sunwell, essentially. Similarly, Swordsmith provides a reasonable tanking weapon, but more importantly, a very strong two-hander for arms PvE that won't be replaced easily, though doesn't seem to have the same longevity as Dragon Strike. You'll replace it a little bit sooner, especially if Zalaman comes a bit sooner than, you know, perhaps it did in reality. Blacksmithing also allows you to craft and equip arguably the best chest in the game around Sunwell time. At worst case scenario it's going to be a tiny bit worse than the best chest in the game so you kind of get basically the same deal. So it has really good late game value even once you've replaced your weapons. Having laid all these blacksmithing benefits out there is a real tension here for warriors that want to PvP however. May Smith provides the dreaded skill herald, which has a chance to stun on hit for 3 seconds, but better than that, the proc is pretty often and does not provide diminishing returns with intercept or the stun from mace specialization in the arms tree. Yes, it's ridiculously good. So you may want to consider playing Fury PvE if you're keen to blast arena, because May Smith is going to provide you both your one of your best PvE weapons and almost certainly one of your best PvP options up to pretty much the end of the game where you get these super high-end items. If you wish to PvE as arms though, you're going to really want to have a sword over a mace. One final thing on blacksmithing is that its value is fairly reliant on how Blizzard releases content. If we get 2.0 itemization to begin with, blacksmithing will be truly essential for many specs because the stats on items in the early stages of TBC were plain awful. They just didn't compete very well against blacksmithing, against a lot of the heroic items, etc. Likewise, if they re release Zulaman alongside, say, tier 5 content, instead of alongside tier 6 content, or just before tier 6 content, those final versions of your blacksmithing weapons won't look quite as good. They'll still be strong, and very useful, but Zulaman has a ton of great gear, to put it simply. Similar to other classes, the remaining options if you escape Kim Jong leatherworking are dual crafting and enchanting. Dual crafting once again has a strong late game craft and for DPS warriors this will be your best neck in the game by quite a large margin and also you get slightly better gems for yourself. Enchanting for melee rings gives us plus four all stats to each ring exclusively which is ultimately going to give you just under 0.25% crit because 33 Agi is equal to 1 crit in TBC instead of the 20 that it is in Classic WoW at the moment. 
and 16 attack power. As a final mention on professions, you can consider engineering as it provides progression of good helm pieces in the goggles that do get an upgrade in Sunwell Plateau. However, I will point out that if we're truly min-maxing, these don't actually become your end game bis, though they may be bis at different periods of time based on your guild progression. For example, the Mayhem Projection Goggles are inferior to a very small list of helms in the game, and in regards to any significant upgrades, the only real huge upgrades that you'll be able to acquire over these goggles are from Kill Jaden, particularly which is the final boss of the game, so do bear that in mind. Finally, we're on to PvP. And here I am going to completely ignore Fury. Whilst you may be able to give some inexperienced players at low to medium rating, Fury is not going to be competitive with arms assuming the same player skill. So let's just throw that out the window for a second. Arms is quite simply S tier in arena. It brings mortal strike and a lot of damage as it does now in classic WoW. However, now warriors receive some nice tools in Spell Reflect and Intervene particularly. These two have an enormous impact. Spell Reflect provides some much needed counterplay to range disruption or damage, whilst Intervene allows you to be more mobile in general with the ability to go back and pill for your teammates without putting Intercept on cooldown. And absorbing the next melee or ranged attack on them, it's just really, really good. The class has lots of tools, lots of damage, it's pretty tanky overall. It's just a fantastic class for Arena. Keeping this brief, arms can be paired with almost any healer in 2s and any combination of healer plus DPS in 3s to pretty strong success. Competitively, however, there are some comps that stand out. In 2s, you will find a lot of joy when partnered with a Resto Druid, whilst there are some contenders for top 2s comp that weren't previously well known to private servers like Warman and Endless amongst others, Warrior Druid is a really, really strong top-notch 2s comp. In threes particularly, Warlock, Warrior, Druid and Dispel Cleave aka Double Healer will likely be your go-to comps if you're focused on choosing the optimal comp for climbing the ladder. Both of these have extensive evidence from both OG TBC and Endless slash Warmain as probably the most viable contender to the RMP throne that people tend to hype up as the most OP threes comp. That said, we will see how it plays out with modern PvPers. Maybe there is some true spice we've yet to see. The Chaos of Fives is not something I'm confident in discussing at length, but Warriors typically find spots on most teams just due to how powerful the MS effect is in teamfights. With that covered, this brings us to the end of the video. I hope you found it helpful in deciding whether you want to commit to playing a DPS Warrior, and I will see you next time, hopefully, in your notifications.